The following review is intended for entertainment purposes and targeted for adult fans of the series. Next time on a comically long review, however... Hello there, heroes! I'm the Pumpkin Ranger, and welcome to another comically long review. This time, it's back over to Marvel and the giant kaiju-fighting superhero, Ultraman. The first issue packed in a lot of exposition and a badass backup story. Can the next issue follow suit? Let's find out by taking a look at The Rise of Ultraman, issue number two. Please make sure you're subscribed to my channel to see all of my videos. Ring the bell, get your notifications set up so you're notified of whenever I post brand new videos. And if you'd like to lend any financial support to my channel, please consider checking me out on Patreon or Coffee at Orange Ranger Videos. As I start talking about the covers, something interesting to comment on. I can't be sure, but I feel like this issue is printed on lower quality paper than the first. There's not a huge difference, but I can just see a bit more creasing in this cover and the pages just feel slightly thinner. Get on with it! MPG, I'm speaking. Please allow me to finish and then we can have a conversation, okay? The main cover is good, movie poster style of all of our main players. Well, except for a spaceship that I don't remember seeing before. And a kaiju. Art Germ gives us this cover, a nice painted style of Ultraman fighting a kaiju. Masayuki Goto gives us a stylized look at Ultraman preparing his final attack. Ultraman is weirdly hunched over while doing so, but that might be a thing. Arthur Adams and Jason Keith team up for this 1 in 25 cover, Ultraman in a superhero landing pose with a literal wall of kaiju behind him. The credits page has a nice little write-up summarizing the basic story premise. Nice touch to bring in new readers, especially since issue number one was kind of hard to get a hold of. We start in some kind of internal mental dimension thing where Shin and the Ultra are together. It manifests as a memory where Shin and presumably Kiki are running from a small kaiju in a hallway. Shin describes how it was their own fault. They sneaked in. I think that snuck in, but hey, he's having a rough day. He says they were just looking for adventure and new experiences together. The two get cornered, and Shin, who is literally floating above the action with the Ultra, says this is more intense than he remembers. The Ultra tells him that memories are not perfect recordings, but that doesn't mean it wasn't this intense. Okay, I guess that makes sense. The Kaiju gets blasted by presumably USP soldiers with more Kaiju in the building. Suddenly, just now, Shin realizes, hey, this is kind of weird, asking what's going on and who the Ultra is. It says he knows who it is, and he remembers shooting it. As the young ones below celebrate how incredible that all was, the Ultra tells Shin that they are both dying. We see that outside, the USP has properly arrived at the crash site, blocking off the area and analyzing things. The captain asks Fuji how she is, and she's about as good as can be expected. He apologizes about Shin. She asks what's going on with him, Shin clearly not being dead since he's floating right there behind her. The captain says they are studying that, but she's been here watching them for 19 hours and knows they haven't learned anything. She berates him for attacking the Ultra before knowing what it was, pressuring Shin into shooting it. He says that was standard procedure, but acknowledges that he might have been wrong. He asks what she wants him to do, and she asks for help figuring all this out. He's told her all he knows, and says the director likely won't tell them anything more. She has basically given up on the official channels anyway, and says she has another way of getting information. I've got it! Arson! Back to the flashback with no transition save for the Ultra speech bubble. Shin and Kiki got very conspiratorial at this point, trying to learn who the USP are. The Ultra reminds Shin that he's dying, and he says, hey, if he's dying, he can do whatever he wants. The Ultra points out that, yes, he's dying, but he never said that it couldn't be prevented. Shin says... 
Once again, things that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! But the Ultra basically says that Shin changed the channel before it could mention that. The Ultra says this is a merging process where neither of them are truly in control. It's normally perfectly safe, but the Ultra is also having a rough day. Ship getting shot, and then it getting shot. The process has been compromised. We see some of each of their memories, totally normal Earth human memories for Shin, but an Emerald City, a tall tower, and multiple Ultras for the Ultra as this Ultra asks Shin to give up control of his body. I bet those two other Ultras that we saw were prominently featured in some Ultraman show or another and are very distinct, visually recognizable characters. Once again, I have never seen a single episode of any Ultraman show, so I have no idea who they are. Kiki and the Captain... Kiki and the Captain sounds like a sitcom or maybe a morning radio show are driving in the woods. An astrophotographer was taking a time-lapse shot of the sky, giving them a whole series of photographs to track things with. The captain was told about the ship getting shot down, but Kiki has another tool at their disposal. Like Shin, Kiki has also developed an amateur kaiju tracker, but hers actually tracks any exotic energy, and she's detecting a bunch at this nondescript farmhouse. I love how the captain says he finds it hard to believe a secret USP weapon is being housed in a cow shed, as the caption points out that the secret USP weapon is being housed in a cow shed. A USP agent opens the door and the captain recognizes him. He bluffs the reason to be there, saying the director wants him to inspect the weapon. The agent says that's fine, but he does need the passcode. The captain gives him the passcode, a strong headbutt. Kiki can't believe he did that, but he points out another irregularity with this. He's supposed to be in charge of all of the personnel in this area, and the agent that was at the door was scheduled to be off today. So information is being kept from him as well. And back over to the Ultra Mindscape. Shin isn't fond of the idea of giving up control of his body, but the Ultra says it's vital and shows him an explanation. Time for Backstory! So, humanity has learned about the Kaiju, but the Kaiju are not unique to Earth. They exist across the multiverse. Hmm, second issue of the series, and we're already mentioning the multiverse. And some mysterious energy pushes them into this dimension and powers them. They are drawn to negative human emotion. Darkness of the soul, as the Ultra says. Greed, jealousy, hate, etc., etc. The Ultra species were able to ascend beyond the reach of the Kaiju. This is why they are called Ultra. They decided to try and show other species how to do this and thus be safe. However, not every species can evolve in this way. You know, some of them need stones, some have to reach a certain happiness level, whether it's day or night, you know, etc, etc, etc. In those cases, the Ultra defend those worlds and fight the Kaiju directly. They do this when a Kaiju crisis is imminent. The Kaiju feed on negative emotions, such as fear. They are also scary, so they create fear that brings more, that create more fear, that brings more, that so on and so on and so on, until a world is just done. Earth is reaching that point. Shin asks if the Ultra has come to teach them how to evolve. No. Shin realizes the Ultra has come to fight then because it thinks they can't evolve. It says no. It knows they can't. 54 years ago, my brother came to assist you, and you killed him! Back to the cow shed with no transition. Maybe this is just a Higgins thing. I remember that a bit during Shattered Grid. Oh, and I'm pretty sure that this cow shed is using TARDIS tech, because I think it's quite a bit larger on the inside. Moving right along. Kiki has realized that the gun, Project Starlight, is absolutely made using alien technology. They head back outside and she grabs a laptop. 
Remember how she has an energy scanner? If she filters the search for just the energy that the gun is giving off, she sees it in three places. Where the gun is, duh. USP headquarters also makes sense. But hey, there's a third place out in the woods far away from the city. It also happens to be somewhere where the tree cover prevents satellite surveillance. Whoever is out there has the answers to some questions. A USP VTOL flies overhead, and it's pretty clear that the two of them are not supposed to be there. Time to go! The plane starts shooting at them. But the captain basically says they'd be dead if they wanted them dead. These are warning shots. He thinks they can make it to the tree line and kill the lights, but Kiki says they don't have time. So he tells her to slow down so he can roll out. He says if she's going to make it to the house in the woods, they need to split up. Kiki says he'll be arrested at best, but that actually works for him. He's given his entire life to the USP, and now there are questions of morality that he needs answered. He tells her to make him proud and leaves the car, shooting at the plane like a badass. Showing how the mindscape is emerging, we see statues of Moraboshi and the Ultra he encountered, both memorialized on their own worlds. They each feel that they were killed by the other, but Shin says the Ultra has already been wrong once. It said Earth is on the verge of a crisis, but they aren't. The USP has things under control, most people not even knowing about the Kaiju. The Ultra says they have technology that can predict a crisis and tells Shin to search his mind and see that he's not lying. Shin returns the offer to show that he's not trying to bluff. They've been very effective. The Ultra basically says that they are not on the same page at all. Kiki finds a house where the energy signature is and inside is Dr. Yamamoto, a very gruff scientist. She tells him about the gun, how his house has the same energy, and the ship that was shot down. He invites her inside to discuss a second ship and what evil the USP could perpetuate with this one. Shin tells the Ultra that he can see it truly wants to help, but he refuses to believe that humanity is incapable of evolving. He's willing for them to merge, but he has to be the one in control, the Ultra acting as a guide. The Ultra asks what humanity would need to evolve. Does Shin know? The distance to allow for multiple perspectives, an appreciation of sublime synchronicity, reverence for our natural connections, cultivated appreciation of diversity, a brave and informed imagination, grace in the face of crisis, belief in the possibility of necessary probabilities, authentic security that can be shared, calm in the face of the contradictory, to attune their senses, become constantly aware of malaise and danger, achieve plurality, imagine boldly and with informed confidence, create space for a shift in perspective, connect with the universal state of grace, discover the adjacent possible, build the bridge between the flesh and the divine, disengage from trauma, embody the omnilogical mind, understand the precedent for change. Revere the natural universe and the oneness of our energies. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> That's basically Shin's exact reaction and the Ultra's point. But Shin insists he is capable of growing, of learning. The Kaiju attack. He felt fear, but also joy. When Kiki got into the USP and he didn't, he felt blinding jealousy, but also love for his friend. He let the captain talk him into shooting the Ultra, but now wants to make that right. The Ultra considers his words and agrees, handing him a small cylinder device and saying he's in control. As Ultra and man become one. Showing us our first look at Ultraman. The word of the day is exposition. Ultraman is very high concept science fiction, so there's a lot that has to be explained. They basically decided that this was the issue where they were going to just get most of that out of the way. The plot does move a little bit with Kiki and the captain investigating the whole mystery thing, but it's mainly just Shin and the Ultra, which sounds like another morning radio show, working through their differences and negotiating how they're going to become the hero that they're destined to be. Not bad at all, just a little bit quieter. The Rise of Ultraman issue number two gets a 3.5 out of 5.
I didn't mention this last time, but these issues have next time previews as well. So, next time on Rise of Ultraman... Overrun by kaiju and pinned behind enemy lines, Kiki could really use the help of a newly merged Ultraman. But what went wrong with the merging process, and how will that impact our hero? Shin must also decide whom to trust, and a wrong choice could cost him everything he holds dear. Next time on a comically long review, however, there's been something of a flip-flop. In my last MMPR review, I theorized that they might have been saving the fight with the Terror Zords for the issue that comes out right before Halloween. Apparently, however, they are saving the conclusion of the dark, mysterious world of Sally Slayer and the Coinless for that. Next time, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issue number 55, the last issue of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers as we know it. That's going to do it for another comically long review. Thank you, Hero, so much as always for watching. Now that the video's done, you can let me know what you thought of this issue as well as my review of it right down there in the comments below down there. And while you're down there, make sure you smack that thumbs up button and let me know that you enjoyed this video. Until next time, Heroes, may the power protect you. Issue number one packed in a lot of exposition and a badass backup story. Can issue... shoot. I bet that those two other Ultras we saw were prominently featured on some Ultraman show on another. You might remember that I theorized 